The Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Collective Whisper Podcast with your host, Simon Kay. Thank you for joining us again. We have a very special guest today, an icon in Irish music history and still showing the young ones how it's done. We'll get to that guest in a minute. But before we do, we'd just like to remind you, please subscribe, follow the show, and spread the word. Thank you very much. This week's guest is Mr. Brush Shields. Brendan Francis Brush Shields, born October 24, 1945, in Fibsburg in Dublin, Ireland, is an influential Irish musician. He has made significant contributions to the music industry, television, and even football throughout his career. In the late 1960s, Bruce Shields formed the original Skid Row with Noel Bridgman and the young Phil Linnett. He played a crucial role in teaching Lynette the fundamentals of bass before Lynette's departure to Orphanage and eventually Thin Lizzy. Skid Row signed with Epic and released a pair of well-regarded albums in the early 1970s. However, despite their talent, the albums were relatively unsuccessful. Nonetheless, Billboard praised Shields, Bridgman and Moore for their album 34 Hours in 1971, indicating their potential for success. In 1972, Gary Moore left Skid Row to join Thin Lizzy, while Shields and Bridgman continued performing under the Skid Row name. This decision led to some dissension due to the appearance of an American band with the same name, although a legal resolution was never reached. Over the years, Bruce Shields' music career evolved. In the late 1990s, he continued recording and touring with his sons joining the band. His musical style shifted away from hard rock, adopting a mix of music hall, comedy and Celtic music. Notably, he briefly collaborated with the eccentric Irish psychedelic band Dr. Strangely Strange. Bruce Shields ventured beyond music and had a TV show called Off Your Brush on RTE. He also had the privilege of being managed by Louis Walsh, a well-known boy band mentor on two occasions. Currently, Shields regularly appears on the Joe Duffy Liveline radio program on RTE, providing musical accompaniment. Despite his extensive career, he still performs live in various venues across the UK and Ireland. Aside from his musical achievements, Bruce Shields briefly pursued a career as a footballer in the 1960s representing Bohemian FC. Furthermore, he actively supports Bohemians and participates in fundraising events to ensure the survival of his former club. In 1986, Bruce Shields participated in the Self-Aid Benefit concert which aimed to support the unemployed in Ireland. He also played at internationally known music venues such as Fillmore West and Whiskey Go Go, showcasing his talent to diverse audiences. Despite facing health challenges in December 2012 when he experienced heart failure caused by a viral infection, Shields made a recovery and continued contributing to the Irish music scene. In 2013, he joined other legends from the Irish entertainment industry to perform at the Philip Chevron Testimonial, showcasing his enduring presence in the industry. Welcome to the show, Bruce Shields. Well, Simon, I'm thrilled, ecstatic, exhilarated, and as an eclectic existentialist, I'm full of energy and exhibitionism. <laughs> wow, there's a thesaurus in there. I'm ready, I'm ready to go, yeah. Bruce, it's lovely to meet you, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You're a great personality from the world of rock and roll in Ireland and the world. Well, lucky enough, we've played most places, you know, all over America, all over Europe, all down through the years. And we played in the smallest gigs in Ireland. And at this stage of my life, I'm too big for the small places and I'm too small for the big places. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, it's like, yeah. you know, when you go for the job and they say you're a little overqualified. <laughs> I, I'm overqualified for most of the gigs I'm doing, you know. There's a very thin line between 10 cc and no cover charge. You know, I haven't exactly. figured it out yet. But, you know. <laughs> no, that that's a great one. And are you doing many gigs at the moment, Rush? Or is it like, how often do you do a gig? I'm doing very few gigs now for the last couple of years. In as much as you, you kind of get birthday parties for 70-year-olds kind of stuff. And everybody kind of thinks I'm big somewhere else. So that's... I've plenty of work in places that I don't really want to go to. If I want to go to Norway or Finland or Sweden, they're all beautiful places, or Holland or Germany. It's a kind of a where are they now sort of, uh, this is still alive type tours. And they put, they advertise me as the guy who taught Phil in it how to play and told Gary Moore what to play, you know, and you arrive and people <laughs> expect you to play sort of Tim Lizzie numbers. Gary Moore numbers, and then they expect you to play the bass. And, 
But I can go anywhere in the Blade of Fields of Atenroy and go to the Old Town and that sort of thing. You know, there's always kind of gigs out there for that. But for the original Skid Row, it's kind of, it's a once a year thing. It's a bit like Philo's anniversary. So you're kind of, you, you, you're very big at a certain time of the year. But, you know, that's probably, that's the best way to put it. Right. I mean, I think what it is with, with all the rockers from different generations, you know, you have your moments. And, and I think sometimes you can have moments when people are really into that stuff and then sometimes people can be forgotten. But I think the great thing is that even when, you know, the legends are gone, people will still remember them in some way and they'll come back to them at different times, won't they? Well, what happens is every time the Republic of Ireland play and the Aviva, that's my version of the Fields of Atten Roy. And every second or third home match in uh, Manchester United at Old Trapper, that's my version of Dorothy Old Town. And for years on Anfield Road, that's my version of the Fields of Art Roy, Glasgow Celtic, my version of the Fields of Art Roy. Now, I've had millions of hits. I've never got one euro for all the plays that uh, <laughs> I've got. And we still get played everywhere, you know, that, for that type of thing. Nobody ever says it's me. They just put it on. <laughs> you know so that, that's it's a pity but I think everyone knows it's you but that's the unfortunate thing about the music business people can know it's you and you know it's you but the money's still not coming through the letterbox I, I, no I don't get paid I've, I've never had one euro for plays you know from anybody anywhere in the world and uh, they, you know Manchester United they, that's a pity well I wouldn't be as interesting if I got paid, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> if the non-payment makes you interesting. I, I'm one of those guys, that, you know, in football, they used to talk about the best football I never have played in Crow Park, you know, all that sort of stuff. And people are interested in the, yeah, I'm the greatest story shocker that never really made it, but almost made it kind of thing. Like, and, but I'm known all over the world uh, by certain bands of a certain age. And that, I, I, that, I'm happy enough when Ord Maiden thinks I'm great. I'm happy enough when ACDC mentions me now and again. I'm happy enough when Status Quo mentions me. I'm happy enough when Lemmy out of Motorhead, you know, all those guys. And even to this day, High on Fire, who won a Grammy there a couple of years ago, they talk about you, along with Gary Brewer and Old Bridge. All these guys, you know, here I am. And you no, know, years and years ago, I remember Joe used to be very interested in. Lads who played in the Playboys over on Texas Mexican border, and they be seventy one or seventy two, and the people that are living in the shack up in the back of the Appalachian Mountains. Now I'm that person, you know. <laughs> There's Japanese newspapers looking for me, chairman said the obsolete magazines that nobody's ever heard of, and they're only interested in people who should have made it, didn't make it, and are still alive, you know. Well, you know that's the kind of story of rock, though, isn't it? Because it's like even, let's say, for example, when you look at U2 and, as you said, Thin Lizzy, they, they always go back to the bands who could have been U2, who could have been Thin Lizzy, and also the bands who influenced them and, you know, gave them the start and everything. So there's always conversations about the could have beens, isn't there? Well, that's, that's I'd be kind of, I'm, I, you know, I would, I'm what they call a pioneer. Like, I trucked around America with Noel Bridger and Gary Moore playing in the Whiskey You Go. We'd been in the Whiskey You Go go one night and... Jimmy Page, John Bonham, Robert Plant, Rod Stewart, Ron Wood, they're all in the audience, plus numerous other luminaries. They all reckon we were going, definitely going to take off. Following night, we're playing with the Alma Brothers, one of the greatest American rock bands of all time. Then we're playing in the Fillmore West in San Francisco with uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers and Benches. Two it all around America for a couple of months, done it again, then came back and went on the Dole in Gardner Street. You know, and that's, people like to hear that. That's very interesting. You know, how did you go from all over the world next minute? You're standing on the dole in Gardner Street and all you have left is a leather coat. <laughs> but at least I had the best leather coat in the queue. <laughs> That's kind of the way music and theatre and acting is, isn't it? You can be in the spotlight. You can look like you're doing really well. And then, as you said, the next day you're down in Gardner Street and people can't, there's no correlation. They're like, I saw you on the telly yesterday. How were you here? That, that, that type of thing. Like when I, when I got to the hatch for the first time and the girl was giving me the little pencil that they have toyed with a bit of twine so nobody steals it. And she asked me, she says, what's your name? You know, and everybody in the queue answered for me, you know. 
That's all it is. You know, where are you from? You know all the that stuff. So the Dublin lads, they kind of got up me, but that's to most people. That's more interesting than just taking off. Like how I went all around the world, came back, went on the dole, then kind of had to get going again. So it got going again, then got going again after. So every so often, I, I reinvent myself. But like I'm 77 now, and the only way I can reinvent myself is by making it to 78. You know, so well, that's the way I'm going to do it. So I got a, a lifetime award off the uh, hot press there at Noel's gig in the, the Olympia. But I reckon it, once you get to 77, yeah. you should automatically get a lifetime achievement award just for getting there. Nothing to do with music at all. A bit like the bus pass. Everybody should get one. Music or not. Yeah, just, just for getting there, you know, despite the odds. So all, all in all, basically at this age of my life, I kind of... Uh, there are people that are just interested in what I'm not doing and what I used to do. And you find that, you know, yeah. I remember growing up and you were like in this presence on Irish music, you know, and because you were, you'd, you'd see on the telly a lot and you were involved in so many. I always remember two names that were always involved in music at that time in the Irish scene was Shea Healy and yourself. You'd always see on the telly or involved in different ways and um, the thing about it was, it's, you don't forget those names and those faces. And I think for everybody who knows Tin Lizzy and everybody who knows Gary Moore, everybody knows Bro Shield worldwide. And I think what it is, you have that presence that will always live on. And, you know, to see you looking so great at 77 is amazing. And to see you playing the odd gig and still playing around the world, that's amazing, you know? Well, you know, in a way... Yeah, yeah. As you get older, if you come up with new ideas, uh, people, you know, you have to come up with new ideas that are not necessarily musical. So the next thing I'll be doing is talking about. I'll get back to talking about music in a minute, but the next thing I'll be talking about, which is very esoteric, is the electromagnetic field. You're saying yet yeah before you heard what I said, sir. <laughs> electromagnetic field that. <laughs> <laughs> the electromagnetic field <laughs> the electromagnetic field of the heart so the next time I arrive on the late lay, I think Paddy Kilty will be on it I think so anyway, but anything can, anything can change between this and that I'll be on talking about the electromagnetic field of the heart and singing songs that you write as you get older so I'll, I'll be doing a one man show as well called I'd rather be a rat can tour than a cantankerous whore. That's the name of it. So I, I write these little songs and I do my party pieces. So I have little things that I can do. And then I can play, uh, you know, the fields of Baton Rouge, right, dirty old town. I can, you know, whiskey in the jar, give them all the trash. And then I can uh, do a few of the old skid row things. Sometimes I play bass, sometimes I play mandolin, sometimes I play acoustic guitar. Sometimes I just go, as they say, Al Capulco, like on my own, sort of, you know, ready to jump off a cliff in Mexico, but the old one at the same time. But the, the, the electromagnetic field of the heart is because I am the only, you have to get this, I have to get this right now, I am the only double hip replacement elite master sprinter in Ireland. They can't find anybody who has double hip replacements that can sprint. Also, they can't find anybody in England. And if there's anybody over your way, so wherever you are now, so let me know. But we're looking for anybody in the world, double hip replacement, master, that's over 65, like you had a free bus pass, and uh, that can sprint. So I'm a sprinter, so I'll be talking about that, but I'll be talking about it in re- not just in relation to the fact that I can sprint, but how I can sprint and how, that, how I link that up with the electromagnetic field of the heart. So I'm kind of a working class intellectual, really. <laughs> I love the fact that you just created a new sport there, a double hip replacement uh, sprinting over 65. Yeah, elite master, elite masters. The elite is very important. Elite master sprinter. But if, any, if anybody wants to look at uh, YouTube in 2014, with me hat and coat on, I'm only a second outside the world master's record. I've done that in 14 seconds. 
before the arthritis kicked in. But that's already that's already up there. So anybody wants to see that, they have a look at that. That's it's interesting, you know. So have me hat and coat on. I do it in fourteen seconds. <laughs> As we're talking about this now, and you're saying you're 77, we're really going into your future. But I want to go back a little bit into your past, and I want to talk about the young Brush Shields and okay. what got you into music, and like what was your influences, and you know what made you pick up the guitar and the bass. Tell us about the teenage Brush Shields. Well, before I was before I was a musician, I was a footballer. Like all my brothers are footballers, and me three brothers, two of my brothers, two of my brothers. Are, are the Republic of Ireland Youth Internationals. And I both they both started in the League of Ireland when they were sixteen and seventeen. I started in the League of Ireland with Bowes and I was there for a month. When I was eighteen, I signed for Bowes and dated him there. But on the Visba Road where I lived up since John Davies book as any as any Bohemians fan or any soccer fan will know where it is. On the Visba Road in those days in the late fifties, early sixties, right the very next door to me. We all lived in one room or two rooms. But right next door was a band called Jimmy Cooper and the Blue Shadows. Now about 50 yards up further up the road was a band called the Royal Olympics and across the road was Betty Ann and the Team Beats. And if you look straight up the road there was Tommy Quinn and the Quintets. And I'm in the Cubs like and I'm I'd be fairly young but my Cub Masters started in Miami Tony Bogan and Joe Tyrrell. So Everywhere there was music, everywhere you could think of, and I'm walking as a messenger boy in Aer Lingus, and one of the, every every second day I'd go up Grafton Street delivering post to the different airlines: KLM, Dutch Airlines, Sabina Airlines, Swiss Air, Lufthansa. But anyway, as you're going up Grafton Street, you have to pass Cavendish's shop, and when I'm passing there, there's a lady very well known at the time. In Ireland, the jazz singer called Peggy Dell, and she's in the window playing the piano, and she has a drummer, Pat Fardell's uncle. But anyway, I, I was look. I I stop every day and I go in there and I look at them. And then one day I went in and they had a guitar and amp, uh, eighteen pound eighteen for the guitar, eighteen pound eighteen for the amp, three years to pay. So that sounds sort of like a good idea, you know. So the shadows were out at the time, so that, you know this could work, you know. So. Me dad went guarantor and I got them. So the day I got them, I went in next door to Jimmy, Jimmy Cooper. And I said to Jimmy, will you tune the guitar for me? And he says, your mother told me you were getting a guitar and I have a gig for you the weekend. The weekend. <laughs> I said, Jimmy, like, I can't play. <laughs> he says, no, you don't have to play. It's Rose Twine and she's a yodeler. The band is called The Rangers. And the usual guy, he's at the break in his foot, but he'll be around playing the accordion behind the curtain. So all you have to do is stand out the front and walk up and down and wink at all the young ones. So I said, uh, he says, so well, go over and talk to Rose. She lives in Contarp she, and she'll tell you what to do. So I went over. She asked me to come over at a certain time, about three in the afternoon. And there was a drummer there and he had a little waistcoat on with the Rangers on it. And he looked like he was 11 or 12, and then he turned out to be Desi Reynolds, who in years later became one of the best-known drummers in Ireland, you know, session drummers of all time. And then she said to me, this trombone player is only at the coming out of Artain. He's been there, like, for the last few years. And he's only at the finding out this afternoon that two of the lads who were there, two twins who were there at the same time, they're his brothers, and he never knew that. So he's kind of a bit disordered. Well, he, he's just trying to think like he's playing. He's a great trombone player. So he turned out, he was 17. He turned out to be Danny Ellis. And he went on to, to write a great musical years later called 800 Voices about his time in our time. But in the interim period, he played with Jim Farley and he played with Stage 2 with Joan Mack. And well, then he went off writing. So, but great trombone player. Then there's no doubt. You know, so we, I, I mean a very young drum, drummer and a very young trombone player and a lad that was singing pop bill numbers, Paul was his name, and Rose herself who yodeled, you know, she's a beautiful voice, but you can do all the Slim Whitman stuff and Rosemary, you know, and then the Ted was a lad's name who played the accordion and he was sitting behind the curtain with his foot busted. But anyway, I went over and... <laughs> 
And Rose, nice to meet you. Said, Rose, I can't play. She says, I know that. Says, You'll be getting 15 shillings. She says, All you have to do. You know, no, that's, that's a lot of money. So, oh, no, no. so anyway, so he says, Just keep walking up and down. And Jimmy says to me, Every time you go past these house, you smile at him. That's Jimmy, the keyboard player, the live next door. I said, Yeah, that's what people do. So I just, he, Jimmy says, That's all you have to do when you get on the stage. Smile as if you're looking at Jimmy. I said, no, 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 you wouldn't be looking at young ones. It's not like looking at Jimmy. He said, yeah, you don't wink at Jimmy. I said, no. He said, wink at the young ones. I said, all right. So <laughs> that's how I started. <laughs> but Rose Tynan and the Rangers, winking at the young ones. I love it, the fact that you got the guitar and even a few days later, you were on stage, but you were, your instrument was your wink. That was it. I couldn't play at all, but I could move. I was always a great mover. You know, and the shadows were the whole thing at the time. So I was only out there. I was only just moving as if I was in the shadows and joining. You know, she told me before I started, I was getting 15 shillings, which was, I stopped being a footballer overnight, you know. And uh, like that was big money. Uh, big money. Uh, that, uh, you were born 45. So when you were in your late kind of in 17, 18, that was kind of when you started Skid Row, wasn't it? Well, I know. I was a lot older than that. Yeah. I'd have been about 20 when I started the Skid Row. Gary Moore, Gary Moore was, he, he came in later on. Gary was 15 and a half. Uh, Phil was about 18. Noel was about 19. We, yeah, we, we built that, you know. And Ben Achievers, he was the first guitar player in Skid Row. Yeah. And he won Apprentice of the Year in Guinnesses. And we had to get another guitar player. So we're down in a place called the 72 Club in Middle Abbey Street. And Frank, I, I just, I'll just go back a bit. like. To, but to get Phil, yeah, I, I got I, like I was looking for it when I, I was the band before I was in before Skid Row it was called the Uptown Band, believe it or not. The Uptown, you know, that, that was the name of the band, the Funky Group. And the manager of that band, his name was Ted Carroll. So we let Ted go and we got a different manager in who was a great lad, Larry Mooney. And the flower pearl was just coming in. And we're playing in the scene, and Larry arrives with all these flowers, lovely flowers to put on the wall. He told to the girls, and we'd be singing, If you're going to San Francisco, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, it came to the end of the night, and I asked Larry, like, how much the flowers were, because he was taking the flowers, the money for the, the flowers out of the gig, you know. So we, we had no money left after the, for the dollar went on the flowers, and I asked him, like, how much the flowers were. And it wasn't so much the price of the flowers, was, it was where he bought them. So we could have went to Moore Street and got them for half the price. And so a row ensued. And, I, you know, I threw a few flowers around here and there and they kind of left the band. And the manager who was after being let go, Ted, heard that I was after leaving over the lack of flower power for the one of the better, you know, and he said, would you like to start the band with me? Now, this is the Ted Carroll who went on to... Managers for a while, then managed him as he then started his own record company, Ace Records, plus four or five other record companies he has as well. But at that, at that stage, he was working in the bank. But anyway, so I made him, and we decided that we'd, we'd forget about the funk now that we were playing with the Uptown Band, Soul Band, and we'd get more to the cream. That's that type of thing. So I'm looking for a singer. So I had this pal of mine who was a photographer in the Grafton Street Arcade and I always remember his store that had private eye on him. And I went in to see him and he said to me, uh, he said, I'm going to be running Sound City now as a discotheque. I said, like, what's a discotheque? You know, and I didn't worry about that. He said, we just play records. I said, That's not, yeah, all right. So I said, I'm looking for a singer. And he said, there's a great singer. He said, with a band called the Black Eagles out in Crumlin. He's a coloured lad. It'd be worth getting him. So that lot I'm talking about, Dave Robson, he went on to become the, become the owner of Stiff Records, where he would have had all those, well, not, you know, Elvis Costa and everybody else. If anybody looks up his name, they won't believe the amount of people he signed. And he owned the record company. But those days, like, he's a photographer and he's running a nightclub. And then ultimately, you see all these bands with him. I couldn't believe it. He'd he done exceptionally well. So they're just two of the guys you meet at that time. So I got the bus and I went out to where Phil lives. I got in touch with Phil. He had a phone in there. It wasn't his. His, his, his uncle had a phone. 
So I rang him up and I said, I'll come out and see him. So I got on the bus and uh, went out to his house, knocked on the door, and there he was. And had a kind of a pullover on, I think, which was strange, but looked well on him. And I said, What kind of music are you into? And he said to me, I like Nico on the Velvet Underground. I said, Gee, you can forget about that. Like, so the, the reason I'm here, like, it's uh, Jimi Hendrix, you know, and the cream. And then he said, Well, and I like Paul, so I, Paul Simon. He said, I like that song. I am a rock. I said, Oh, man, man. So, do you want to come up? I said, Tomorrow or the next day, and, and audition for the band. So he says, Yeah, I'll, I'll come over. I said, We'll do Troy Hey Joe. So, anyway, I'm standing there at 10 cent a place. It's just off Tarzette Street there. And Philo comes around the corner with three guys that I'd never seen before. And they were friends of his. And one lad is Frank Murray, who went on to, to manage the Pogues when they had a fairy tale in New York at number one. Frank is only 17 at this stage. He's coming to home to care for me. And Paul Scully, who went on to do the same for Elvis Costello and the Pogues. And a lad, a lad called Nico Flanagan, who's still a revolutionary, but he would have had a, he was kind of a, the last few, he, he's always writing books, me, Hollow Flanagan, and he had a poultry group called La Poste. But at that time, he was talking about every revolution starts up from the battle of the gun, mousy tongue and all that. He was into all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, these three guys arrived and Phil was the audition. Hey, Joe, and the rest is history. So we're going, we're going, we're going to storm them. Couldn't be better than Bernard wins Apprentice of the Year in Guinness. So we need a new guitar player. It meant a lot then. <laughs> so he's an electrician, Apprentice of the Year. So we're playing in the Middle Abbey Street in the 72 Club. And Smiley Bulger is running there. He's about 16 at the time. He's running on behalf of Uncle Bill, who was from the Evening Herald and seemed to be drinking a lot. He was he's, he was the same age as the thing on the door, 72 at the time. But anyway, we're playing away and Frank comes back and he says, there's a great guitar player playing down in the, the Go-Go, Middle Abbey Street. So I said, ask him to come up. So Gary came up and we're playing uh, Strawberry Fields with Bernard with the wah wah pedal. Gary reckoned it was, could never had any, thought the band was the greatest of all time. So I offered him a, a gig with the band and he's 15 going on 16. And he says to me, would you, would you mind talking to me father? You know? So I said, all right. So he headed up. And then I got a call from the next day. He says, come up and see me father. So two days after that, he said, I'll meet you outside Stormont, at the gates of Stormont in Belfast. So I went up and I met his father. And his father was 35, going on 36. And he asked me, could I look after Gary? <laughs> I said, yes. Yeah. So Gary came down and away we went. And, then we're fine, everything is gone, couldn't be better, we're going to storm them, fellow having trouble breathing properly. And he says he has to go, his mother's gonna take him over to Manchester and get his tonsils done. And well when he was over getting his tonsils done, I thought we sounded better without him, because I was out the front now and but, you know, we we don't have to sort of keep the solo short. We're gonna get into the cream and Jimi Hendrix and then had to let Philo go. So I said, so, yeah, so that's where the, the whole story came from. Is that the fellow? I'll teach you how to play. And if you do it, if you come over to my house every day for six weeks, at the end of six weeks, you'll be able to join a band. And at the at the end of eight weeks, you'll be able to start your own band. And he believed me. That's the way it went. You know, that came to Lizzie and then Skid Row. We went on. It's as easy as that. So I don't know. It took a bit of a while. That was the best way to fire someone ever was to say, listen, I'm letting you go, but I'm setting you up for the future. Well, I, I let him. I let him go, and if it had known he was going to be bigger than me, I wouldn't have shown him half the stuff I showed him. <laughs> <laughs> or you, you wouldn't know. have let him go. <laughs> I, well, I, well, so you know, somebody once said to me, "Is there any one thing you wouldn't do if you could do it all again?" Yeah, I wouldn't answer hypothetical questions, but whatever happened, it went away. There's loads of different ways of looking at it. If I hadn't have let him go. We might have made it, and he might be still alive. But everything went the way it went. And now, Noel, one of the best fans of all time, he's gone. Philo is gone. Gary Moore is gone. And Ben Achievers, he's not working in Guinnesses anymore, but he's still a great electrician and a great guitar player. You know, but <laughs> they were, you know, they were the boys. <laughs> yeah. And that was that. That was that was the start of it, you know. When you got Skid Row going, you know, and you you were singing and so on, and then you released your albums, you know, and 
I think you signed in 1970 with Epic and so on. So when you signed with Epic, what was that um was that something where you had an album all ready to go or you know they said to you okay we need an album. How did that go? Well the way it worked was we we were on CBS in England which is Epic in America. And the only other two people that we knew that was on it was Jeff Beck. And we toured him for a while, Beck, Bogart and the PC. Bogart and the PC were at the coming out of a band called the Vanilla Fudge, who had a very big hit in the late 60s. Where, uh, Help me please, why don't you be there? Yeah. You keep me hanging on. And Sly and the Family Stone, they, they were on Epic. But we signed the worst possible deal you could possibly... We signed with CBS. The first contract they put up, but our, you know, we were the voice, just signed that. And when we, it was so bad that we never got paid to this day. And then they were epic in America, but we did a different deal in America. If we were on, we were on half percent, one half of one percent of the profits. <laughs> never got paid. You know, we're on it now. We're on the side. Yeah, never got paid. And whatever we were on with CBS in America, we still held on money. And the first album we made in a day and the second album we made in 34 hours. And we sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And to this day, they can still come up with figures to say, well, you still owe us for this or you owe us for that. We don't know what we owe them for, you know. But we never got paid out of those two albums either, you know. They're still out selling. It's sad, isn't it, that, you know, as you said, even years later, you after all those sales and everything, they still think you owe them money. Yeah, we've never, we've never had any money, you know. Uh, so we, we chased up our music public. We made, chased up our music publishing there about three years, four years ago with Campbell Combley. Now let me say, I'm sick of it. And they said that they couldn't go back. They couldn't go back to when we were selling loads. They could only go back. And the best they could do for us was, 1,500 euros from me and uh, 1,250 euros from Noel. He's the drummer. I wrote everything. I got an extra 250 euros. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like, it doesn't sound like much when you, but when you talk about it, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, the, I, I, you know, this guy is like, there's, there's people that wrote songs that got very depressed and a couple of lads even Bad thing that they ended their own lives. They wrote that thing. Uh, I can't live it living this without you. You know, and if you hadn't got a sense of humour, you could get very upset. So I mean, that's all I'm saying. And uh, you know, you kind of you can be philosophical about it, which is a good excuse for not letting the body. It. And that's what I'm always saying. Like I won't let the body. Be. But if you let the body, you, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. That's the other thing. So you have to sort of you know, it's a fate that can't be, and it's not that easy to. It's a, it's, a, it's a you know it's a bit uphill, but you, know, you, you go again and you do whatever you can, you know. You go again. You start. You start up again. So, in in seventy two, then Gary Moore went to join Lizzie and so on. Was that a kind of a body blow to you, really? Then because you were kind of, you know, you had something great going, and I know it was hard work and it was hard to get paid. But then when one of the members leaves, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, when he left it was, it was impossible we, because under no circumstances could we replace him at that particular time. There wasn't that standard of guitar player. Great guitar players everywhere, but we had played with Gary for two years nonstop, like sometimes six, eight hours a day, and it was telepathic. And he, he actually left to start his own, he actually left to start his own band, uh, the Gary Moore band, and whatever... It got complicated because we had the same manager and he was given 27,000 sterling to get the band going and pay for uh, equipment and vans and everything else. And somewhere in between that 27,000, so nothing that got to do with me or Noel, we kind of got half billed for it. <laughs> it's not, I don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, we don't know what way, who got money for what or why, but he got the 27. Myself and Noel hadn't achieved my name at this time. So Gary got, Gary went through the 27 in about three months with a brand new van and uh, brand new amps and gear and this, that and the other. And then he fell out with our manager. But because he was uh, under 18 when he signed, Gary could walk out of the music publishing. He could walk out of any contract because he'd no solicitor there with him at the time. So he was blessed in that way. So they could, you know, myself and Noel, we were held responsible for everything. 
it's a strange kind of thing. You know, you learn as you go along, but you, you don't get a chance to do it that way that, that often. That's tough, isn't it? And as you said, at that stage, he was an integral part of the band and he's such a high caliber guitar player. It's very hard to fit, get somebody like him, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was impossible. Like these, are the, these were the days of the guitar players. Jimmy Hendrix, Eddie Clapton, over here, Rory Gallagher. Gary was up there with them all. So consequently, it, it looked like it was his band and we were playing with him, you know, to the average sort of... It, it, would, it, it would always appear that it was the guitar player's band, even though they, like Jack Bruce or Ginger Baker would never say that or that type of thing. But uh, so we, we couldn't we couldn't replace him really. So ultimately, Noel had to sell his rooms to go home. And I came home and went on the dole and we got together and we started again and we started in the, you know, no cover charge sort of took it to wherever it took us again then then years and years later we wind up in the fields of Adroy the fields of Adroy do at the old town and Noel is not there because Noel just wants to play the blender. Yeah, you kinda changed your style to be whereas you were kind of rock and blues, you kinda changed it more then to be more folky and more like that Irish sound as you say. More, yeah, more, more accessible really, like if, if the truth was known. And the truth is not is the truth is known. Like we made the fields of Atten Roy, Dirty Old Town. We went in and we done twenty one numbers for two hundred euros. The poster cost more than the album. Uh, the, the poster was three hundred euros. Eighteen Celtic rock classics. Until this day, that album is still selling, and I still get very little out of it. Never got on for the place, but that came out in nineteen eighty eight, and it took off with nineteen ninety with the soccer, and off it went. And it's been going ever since. So that's, you can work out how, how long that is. Now, we're at this stage where, a bit like yourself, saying if people are prepared if I talked about what I was doing rather than do it for them, you know, like do it in small doses. So I'm kind of, I'm a rack hand too who can play exceptionally well. But I, I mean that in a kind of a, no, I mean it the way I said it, actually. Yeah, I, I play exceptionally well. So people prefer if you spoke, then you play it. Then you talked about whatever you were doing and what you weren't doing and what you were doing, what you shouldn't be doing, and yeah, and you were doing what you shouldn't be doing and all that stuff. And ultimately, you have to be. Ultimately, one of the things that I had got me is that I'm a dub who's reasonably witty, and I enjoy myself kind of all the time, even when I'm not enjoying myself, which I know is a contradiction, but that's a good way of talking. So what you do is. You, I'm not, you know, some people are born lucky, some people are born blessed. I'm lucky I was born blessed. So I can talk and play and talk and play and I've done things. You know, that sort of thing. And I'm still doing things. I think myself, for you, what makes your personality shine through and what has always done so for years in the Irish psyche is you have a great personality. You're very witty. And of course, I think the people that everyone knows, the character Bruce Shields, they don't know the character as, let's say, played with Gary Moore. They know that's part of your history, but that's not what you're famous for, I think. I think you're famous for who you are, your wittiness, your humor. You have a very positive outlook on life. And, you know, you've, you've given us some gems of comments and given us some great songs over the years. So all around, it, you can't label you just for a few things, you know? Well, Simon, I know it sounds, but that's, that's exactly right. Like we're blessed, we're at we're at this age that we never thought we'd be, get anywhere close to, and you tend to the older you get, the more more philosophical you get. You hear you hear say you hear yourself saying things like, "I wouldn't lift that out if I was you," you know. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't lift that. Yeah. You know? But anyway, I wouldn't lift it one way or the other. But if I was you, I definitely wouldn't lift it. But anyway. This is called philosophy, but there are other, I'm not going to do that, it. Yeah, there's higher levels of, you know, I think, therefore I am. I am, therefore I think I am. I am, I think, I think I am. Am I, I think, you know, you can be thinking too much, you don't know if you are or not afterwards. Yeah, am I, I think, you know, all that stuff. Just, uh, yeah. There's always the question at the end, am I? I think I am. Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> am I? I think, yeah, I am, I think, yeah. I think what it is for you as well, 
you had this resurgence then, obviously, in the 90s with Fields of Athen Rye and with That's the right. Dirty Old Town. And then you were you were on through the football as well, which was great because you had a big involvement from your time with Bohemians and everything and your brother's involvement. So I think once you once you came back on the, the national airwaves and on the television, it, it gave your career a bit of a resurgence, didn't it? I did. I, 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 well, it's got the... Most people don't even know I was in Skid Row, but the truth was known. I'm in Crow Park doing the international rules at half time, 82,000 people. And I go, boy, ah, uh, and I don't have to sing the fields of that. And I go, boy, uh, 82,000 people take over. But they all thought, like, they, they had no idea. They all thought I arrived in 1990 with the uh, fields of that and Ryan do the old town. You know, that, that was the gas thing. People never knew that. You know, for twenty years before that, or twenty five years before that, nineteen nineties, people thought it was kind of half new. They didn't know where it came from. Before the nineties, obviously, in eighty six, you had the self aid benefit concert, and that was a big event too. That that was kind That's of right, yeah. that was kind of the I suppose your not your door back in, but was when you started to get noticed again, wasn't it? The, the funny thing was that I came up with this joke: if you can't get Bono or Bob get brush. You know, they were looking at those two boys and nobody could get them to talk about this, that, and the other. Because I was available all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was just laughing there. Well, I'm laughing all the time, but one of the funniest things was they were talking about how much the boys in RTE were getting for the radio shows and the television sure, shows. Yeah. And then I said, she like, I had a radio show at that time and I had a television show. And both of them, the, the radio show brush. won the Jacobs Award. Yeah, won the Jacobs Award. And the radio show had the biggest view on ever for that time. Or sorry, the television show that went out the same time as the news. And for the radio show, I got 200 euros. 200 euros for the radio show that won the Jacobs Award. And I got 300 euros and the tax was stopped over. For the television show, I obviously should have got Noel Kelly in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I you had know. the wrong agent. I thought no Kelly was a right for right for the full back that was playing for West Cabra I mean, you know, like nobody told me that there was money. Like somebody says, you give me give two hundred euros for the radio, and then it wins the Jacobs Award, and then I'm on the telly doing the off your brush, yeah, off your brush, and uh, huge viewing at that time. So three hundred euros for that, and they were stopping, you know, tax on each thing. But uh, yeah, definitely. I love that line that they, you were getting the three hundred euros, and then they took the tax out of it. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. I'm at this thing, but, having, fair enough, but all the boys were saying, "Yeah, but you're on for a half an hour once a week." I said, "Yeah, but I'm not playing any music." I, I knew what was happening. You know, I wasn't actually playing anything, and people were kind of looking at it because it was a bit, a bit of crack. And then it got to the stage where people thought I might be a comedian, you know. Right. And uh, and then they were willing to like book me for gigs, like if I just came along and sort of, you know, done. That. But I, I couldn't, you know, so I'm like I don't know any jokes. Or this is really. I don't think you need jokes, Brush. I think you're that kind of character who just comes out with it, and you're it's magic, you know. It's, I, well, you know, I, I have this. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm the, one of the reasons I'm never stuck. For, for anything is that over the years I, I remember reading about uh, the Ginger Man by PJ Dunleavy but the, the, there was another book advertised at the same time where all, everything was done with starting with the letter B so I was saying like what, would, what, I sh- what, I sh- what I should do is I should learn the whole alphabet and be able to talk in any of the twi- 26 letters so say for instance I took Z Zig and Zag had the same zest for Zeppelin, Zap is easy, and Zits and Zombies and Zippers and Zebras and Zebras, all in the zone of the Zoological, the Gozing and the Zitter, Zoom and the Zephyr, and they knew the Zulu, on the Zigmund and the Bobby went from Zealot to Zenith with the Zeal of the Zealot and the Zitgeist of Zazimus. You know, that sort of thing. So I can do the whole alphabet like that, you know, that, that sort of thing. So X is the smallest, X max is the spot where the X weighs. <laughs> You know what I have to say? You have a fantastic memory because, you know, when people used to talk about Jimmy McGee, the memory man, but as I'm talking to you and you remember all those names and you remember all those sentences, your memory is fantastic. Well, I, 
I'm blessed with that. You know, that I can kind of, you can remember anybody who owes you money, you know, and nobody owes me money, but I have the same way to remember. Yeah. But you can remember any, anybody who owes me money. I can't remember who they are, but you can remember anybody. But uh, you, it, it's easy enough for, for me to remember things because, you know, when you're, I'm not just saying this, but when you're fairly confident and somebody introduces you, themselves to yourself, you don't have to spend any time trying to sell yourself. So you can spend all your time taking an interest in them and remembering the name. It's no problem because I'm not, you know, I'm just happy enough to talk to them, have a bit of crack and whatever it takes. And then I can remember where I was and what I was doing, you know, all that sort of stuff. And had had a great time, and, you know, even when things weren't going well. It was always interesting. Always interesting. Always, when, when I was in trouble, it was always interesting. Tell us about Dr. Strangely Strange. Gary was living with them. I was living with a couple of them, you know, and they, I can't tell you. Did, did you ever, did you ever buy that? Uh, did, did you ever buy that album at all? So I don't know. No, but I remember hearing about it. I remember hearing about it. Anyway, if you get that album, which was re-released about three years ago, Andy Irvine tells a story on the cover about Gary Moore that I won't be telling you today, but it's worth having a look at it because. Anyway, wherever I was the night before, I was with my great pal Joe Colgan, who had a record company called Song Records. And we had to go looking for Gary because Gary, they were actually looking for a new guitar player, I think, for the Fairport Convention. And uh, Richard Thompson was at the leave. And Joe Boyd was coming over to produce Strangely Strange. And they wanted Gary to play with them. And he just made him and say hello to him, see how we get on. So... So we had to get into the studio. They were recording a couple of numbers with Joe Boyd and Joe Colgan, my pal, who's the solicitor and the owner of Song Records. He was giving me a lift because I didn't drive. So anyway, we walked to the studio and Dave Maddox is there from the Fairport Convention. And Tim uh, is playing the bass on the number and he's not great. So anyway, I just met Joe and said hello to him and he says, uh, would you mind playing bass? And he introduced me to Dave Maddox from the Fairport. So I, I played bass on that, and Gary's playing guitar. So I, I got to I got to know everybody around then. Then they went down to Kilkenny, were playing down there, and strangely, strangely playing there. So you know the the guys were kind of coming out of it's very similar, in my opinion, to the Incredible String Band, which was a two piece from Scotland, and I I, I found them sort of fairly similar. They, they they would have been fairly off the wall, and I think it was Tim Goulding and it was Tim the the painter his name could be the same name Boyber something, and uh, like it was all fairly that sort of thing you know like uh, Gary wrote a song called I'll See You Later all the fairies hopping around on under mushrooms and all that sort of stuff good crack you know and so well, all in all that's that's I, I knew them that well and then you get the free CD because you're on it. And even when they brought it out again, we released it there about three or four years ago. You know, it's the same thing again. But I think Andy Irvin was there that day because I was at Andy, when Andy is telling the story about Gary on the slave, I was the one that told Andy. So when Andy's telling the story, he said, I told him this story, which is true, you know, where we were the night before and how we got here this morning. But People could find a fairly people could find a fairly interesting, but I never talk about it. I just say it's not, it wouldn't be one of that well known stories, you know. But it's pretty interesting. You know, at that time you were saying there, for example, you you know, your career was getting a resurgence and you probably had lots of people approaching you to manage you and work with you and everything. But how did you get mixed up then with Louis Walsh? Because you you were with him once or twice. Was that a, a was that something that happened by accident, or did you think, oh, he can help my career, or does he approach you? Well, see, I was with Louis twice. The first time I was with Louis, I was on the way down. I was on the way down, and the second time I was I was at rock bottom. But I I met Louis like the the way we got into the ballrooms was we had this manager called Andy Creighton, and he managed. The Memories and Doc Cardin and the Royal Blues. And I met him in the Bag of Inn, you know, in the mid 70s when we were going exceptionally well. And he just came in and he said to me, uh, I could get you a few gigs around the ballrooms. So I said, Yeah, okay. He said, Would you mind coming down to see me? I have a, a big pub down in Claremont. It's come down on the 8th of December. 
because everybody in the country goes to Dublin on the 8th of December to do their shopping. And I want you to come down and just play a few numbers in the pub and I'll give you a bowl of soup and a ham sandwich. So anyway, we went down and there's Andy, nobody in the town, everybody's gone to Dublin. We were just looking at somebody to talk to, I thought, you know, he's talking away to me, giving me bowl of soup and ham sandwich. And he says, uh, do you want me to get you a few gigs? I said, yeah, and this is the 8th of December. He said, yeah. Well, that would be nice. And, and he said, uh, you're starting next week. And I said, like, like how, can you, how can you get gigs next week? Don't worry, yes. How can you get gigs next week? He says, I'll tell you. He said, do you know where the Longford Arms is? I says, yeah. He says, he, he told me the following Thursday to be outside there in the van. He told me where to park the van. That I could see this lady inside the glass door on the phone. He says, when you get to the Longford Arms next Thursday, he says, the memories will be advertised. I said, all right, yeah. He says, so when you're sitting there at nine o'clock, the phone will ring. That lady will pick up the phone and look out and see you. And I'll be at the town now that the singer with the memories has not enjoyed us. And he won't be able to make it. And you're going to stand in. I said, all right. So nine o'clock, ring, ring. I'm not sitting there. Next thing, the lady looks out, knocks on the window and calls me over. So for six months, we worked like that. We turned up instead of the memories. Every gig nearly was, the memories were advertised. And they were playing some, They were playing somewhere else that night. You know, Andy had put them in somewhere else. If we're doing their gigs, and they're doing other gigs where people, where people wanted them. So the money we got, I th- was the memories money. But Andy kept most of that, but gave us more than we would have got if we were there ourselves, kind of, you know. So we were all yeah, happy yeah. enough with Where that. Where was Louis in the middle know? of that mix? Because we didn't really earn it. Like the Mems brought the people in. I didn't know if he was giving the money to the Mems. And I, I'll never know to this day. Uh, and I don't want to know either. But he gave us more money than we would have got otherwise. And we were all happy enough with that. So for six months, roughly, and then we got back on, on our own name. And then we kind of got paid a bit more. And it's, it's, it's what I call the, the break-even part of my life. Like I broke even. From 1976 all the way up to, you know, 1990 or that. Like my whole, I, I could, if I had a book out tomorrow, I, I could call it that. You know, we broke even. And that would be it. Like we broke even compared to what we could have done. And I'd, I'd be fairly happy. All, all the way, was, you know, the way we done that was good fun. I was going to say to you, when I met Louis, Louis was 16 years old. And I met him in Kilshi Mock in the ballroom there. And the crystal ball in the kitchen. And he's sitting on the stage and he's managing a little band called Faze, F L Z E, I think they were called, I'm not too sure. But he was telling me that he was thinking of going to Dublin to work for a lad called uh, Tommy Hayden. So I arrived in Tommy Hayden's. There's Louis doing the posters. It had to be in Tommy Hayden or something. I can't remember what it was. But uh, there's Louis doing the posters. And he's very 16 or 17. Now, this is where I kind of go off on a tangent. If, if you ever talk to Johnny Logan, Sean Sherrard, Louis' biggest, when I, when, when we, it's the way the world works. When we, when we, when I had to come home and go on the dole in Gardner Street, I had nowhere to live. Or we had nowhere to live. There was Margaret, myself, and Magic. And one of the guys I auditioned when in uh, London, when we were thinking of getting a singer, was Sean's brother, Mick. Mixture out. So when Mick Heather was on the dole, he told me to come up to his house. His father, who, who was a great singer, tenor, Patrick O'Hagan, was off in Australia, New Zealand, on tour for six months. And we had nowhere to stay. Come up with Margaret and myself and Matthew, and we could stay there with John Wilson. He used to play drums with Rory Gallagher in the taste. Rory was, uh, John Wilson was with me at this stage. So anyway, we, we, we go and live with Mick. And who's there only a young Sean Gerard? And he asked me to show him a few cards. Yeah, he asked me to show him a few cards. And I told him that the songs he, he wrote sounded like dirges, you know. They were kind of, you know, they were kind of, I'm a rocker and he's kind of, anyway, to this day he tells everybody that I taught him how to play. But I always told him that uh, the songs were dirges when, when, <laughs> when I met him for the first time. But he still says, he still tells people he's in the Eurovision that I taught him how to play guitar, you know. 
So anyway, so I'm well in with, I'm well in with Louis one way or the other down the years. Then it's only a coincidence that later on that Louis is involved. In, and then I'm a good pal of Louis. And then the other fella that's at the fall and now is Jim Hand. So both of them think they're managing Sean, Johnny Logan. And they're both good pals of mine. Plus, Sean is a real pal of mine from living in the house with himself and his brother Mick, who's, who, who is not that well at the moment living in Manchester. Mick is the best of Sean's brother. But, uh, so you'd be involved with Louis, and then later on, Andy wasn't great around 1981, 82. Andy Creighton, who was booking me out, he kind of, he was a great lad, but he, next thing, he owned the bookies, you know, in Claire Morris. And the next thing I know, he was gone to England. We, we, we kind of, he was a great lad, let's put it like that. So then I, I contacted Louis because obviously from Sean, you know, Johnny, as people call him, I'd have known Louis very well. And asked them to get me a few gigs. And uh, th- then the rest of the history, you know, we were with Louis for a while. And he could only do so much. Like, he wanted me to get a few lights, you know, get some lights on a PA. At this stage, I'm still, I still have no lights. You know, I'm breaking even. I said, Louis, if the lights bring the punters in, I'll send the, lights, uh, I'll send the lights on their own. But he was right. You need lights and all that. So particularly when bands you never heard of. I turning up with 3,000 lights, you know. And complaining that you have no lights and no PA and no credibility because you're not playing the charts and you know you're twenty. What's he doing? But uh, that, that was you know Louis and myself were still the best of pals. Like Louis understands me, and as much as he knows that at that time, like I was kind of you know doing whatever I had to do to get whatever I need. If you <laughs> and I asked you, I love the fact that you said. If the lights can bring in the punters, let the lights do the gig. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to Billy, yeah. <laughs> but plus, I meant it, you know, like... Put the lights on. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. you know, no lights. Tell me then the whole story, well, or the short version or whatever way you want to tell it, about the whole kind of thing with Skid Row in America, Sebastian back. So they started up and... They took the name, and when did you notice they had the same name? No, like, the whole thing was 1986. There was two things happened at the same time. 1986, Gary Moore rang me up, and he said, John Bon Jovi is out there ringing me. They have this band, himself and Richie Sambora, the guitar player from Bon Jovi, and Doc McGee, the manager. They have this band. He said, they can't give them away. They're getting a new singer. And they reckon it would go big and they want to use the skill on the name. And I told John Bon Jovi, this is Gary talking, that it's not got to do with me, that he'd have to ring you. So he'd be ringing you. This is what Gary said. So he never rang me and he used the name. And I can't explain why I couldn't do too much about it, but I couldn't do too much about it because there was even people over here kind of making sure I couldn't do anything about it. So anyway, next thing the singer gets, the singer gets fired, Sebastian. And he's on MTV trying to start a super band with John Bonham's son, Jason, and Ted Nugent. And Jude is watching that. And somebody sends him a message asking why they use the name Skid Row when there was already another Skid Row. And Sebastian actually speaks on MTV and says that the two boys who fired him, Snake and Rachel, told him that they gave Gary Moore $35,000 $35,000 for the name. So at this stage, the two boys have taken $35,000 out of the uh, out of something. And Sebastian never seen that number. But Gary Moore, under no circumstances, he, Gary had nothing to do with the name. I told Sebastian. And uh, Gary wasn't even in the band when we thought of the name. But he'll always, he'll always be a part of Skid Row. So anyway, I told Sebastian that. And then ultimately, uh, tried to get in touch with Bon Jovi and all that. And then did Bon Jovi and the American band fall out and they took him to court and Richie Zambora and Doc McGee. So that was going on. So that's another 10 years gone while that's going on. And then, and then I'm talking to Sebastian and the lad who unfortunately died there last year, his name was Steve Strange. He was the, he was cold plays PR man, but he was also very well involved with bands, including Sebastian Back. And he was, you know, Sebastian was one of them and asked me, would I be interested in putting a bit of a band together and writing a few songs together? And I said, like, we'll get around to it. I haven't got around to it yet. 
But I talk to him about twice a year, and he's great crack. And uh, like you know, you know, you never know. But every year that goes by, it's like Tom Hanks in Saving Private Ryan. Every year that goes by, like you get further away from home. You know, like you get further away from some, and then you live a life. You know, you can't really get them. It's hard to get involved with new people. You, 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 you're, a, you're a kind of a uh, an extrovert recluse at this stage and you enjoy your own company and you enjoy doing whatever you like whenever you like so the chances of me asking somebody what they think what they think at this stage is slim and none you know so if you're trying to play in a band with somebody you, 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 you'd be just telling them without thinking like here just the way it goes and yeah uh, what do you think but you don't really care what they think you know you have a way of doing it good bad or different you, you, you think yeah. yeah, it's like you said there earlier about good bands being telepathic. They don't really have to tell each other so much how it's done. They just feel it, don't they? Well, we we, we, we were young lawyers and we're practicing six to eight hours a day, five, six days a week. And when Phil came over to learn how to play the bass, I said, come over every day for two hours and go home to your, where he was staying with different people and practice for four hours. And that's six hours a day. But some days do eight hours. And he'd done the six hours. And after six weeks, he's ready to join the band. And it was always like that. You work very hard, work very hard. And when the Gary Moore, Noel Bridgman and myself, we're playing in a way that you don't even look over. You don't have to think. You know exactly where it's going to go next. And you're, you're bringing somebody into the band and trying to explain spontaneity or improvisation and, you know, in different time signatures. And I couldn't face learning the songs again and all the different arrangements and doing them as if I'm doing them for the first time. I found that impossible. I couldn't do it. You know, and so that's, that's one of my problems. I'm a slave to spontaneity. You know, that's, I'll always be that way. Really. Just do it once. But sometimes when you do something, you want to do something different and move on, don't you? Even though people might want you to keep repeating the same stuff. Well, yeah, you have to play. Even Bob Dylan doesn't want to play. He's well known. his half of the time, you know. Which I... At this day, like, say for instance, uh, any of these guys, Neil Young, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, they bring out a new album every, every couple of years to go to. When people come along, they still want the songs they want that are all probably 30, 40 years old, plus maybe two or three from what you've done on your last album. So once, once you're really well known, it's like you two going into Las Vegas now. Like, years ago, people would have laughed and said, that's cabaret. It is cabaret. But it's your, you're doing cabaret with your own numbers on a great light show and you're full every night. And it doesn't matter if you're Celine Dion but when it's, when it's, or if you're Adele or if you're you too. But when it gets to the stage where a country singer like Carrie Underwood is singing Guns and Roses or you see Garth Brooks doing a Queen medley or you see one of the funniest, the funniest, funniest things I've seen, Rick Astley. Never going to give you up playing drums and singing ACDC Highway to Hell on Glass. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that recently. I saw that. Well, what it says to you, Simon, that I could be very big tomorrow because everything is about novelty. You know, everything is about novelty. And novelty, yeah, it's really novelty now, in as much as it's, you know, it's like everybody is doing a gig as if they're on the cruise ship. You know, like we will rock you. Yeah, so everything's gone it's, cabaret. It is. And you have to have a big light show and a big show and do it in a particular way. And when ZZ Top start using a drum machine at the same time as that drummer, you know, all those years and years and years ago for the for the hits, they put in a drum machine to keep it, you know. that's every, Everything has kind of gone a bit that way in as much as people use click tracks for playing along with the drums and drum machines. Yeah, you have a big thing with Motley Crue and Nicky Six on the bass, and there's a big controversy about a lot of those click tracks at the moment. Well, there's the, there's the click track. There's the fact that the boys out the front can't sing anymore, and they start the song and, and point the mic at the crowd. And there's a lot of the great singers, you know, are gone a bit like that. And that's the way it is. It's kind of, you know, they're not, every second sort of heavy metal band would be given a kind of a bit of that. But if the truth was known, you know, people don't have the same kind of uh, 
not so much the same interest in music. They wouldn't have the same knowledge about how the music was done. Like years and years ago, people had said about the knowledge. They played a bit. They had a fair idea how it was done. They read magazines that explained how it was done. And they were very knowledgeable. Now, it's, it's really, it's not like that. You go out and you have a great time. You get out of it as quick as you can. And you have all these different stages where they can cover everybody from folk rock to punk rock to rock rock to hard rock to you know to that psychedelic rock to this rock to that rock. And it's a fourteen or fifteen stages. And if you don't want that, you can get a bit of yoga or buy a few herbs, you know, or learn how to lion dance. So you know, yeah, you know. exactly. And even the other day, I heard there were the, this year at the Grammys, they're going to give an award for music made from artificial intelligence, but a real person has to collect it. And you're like, this is crazy. Well, I, I'm kind of, I'm a small farmer. For me, AI is artificial insemination. But I can, I can see where the way the world has gone. Yeah. So you know, like, I just self suck and slurry pump is what you want there, pal. But uh, no, I, yeah. Self yeah, like, slurry. You, yeah. yeah. So, like, that's, that's what I'm saying. So, I'm like, it's, it's all real, it's novelty. You know, everything is novelty. But yeah, when you see the boys turning up, and so, like, years ago, the GAA used to have the Cardinals All Stars. And the boys would dress up. That was the first time you ever seen a, a black toy and the white shirt and this and that. Now, if you get into the Rock and Hall, Roll of, Hall of Fame, they wear the same stuff. You know, you see guys in their bow toys and this, that, and the other. And so, all in all, you know, you, you have to accept that nothing is as it was, or maybe nothing ever was the way you thought it was. But, but we came from a time when people tried to, yeah. Exactly. We yeah, move on. Change. We came from a time when people used to play to their best ability. And then one day I woke up and I, I realized that when Elvis arrived, tens of thousands of great musicians lost their jobs overnight, like in the Count Basie band, Duke Ellington band, Glenn Miller, all those guys who could play couldn't get any work. And Elvis had the three cards and the rockabilly and he looked well. And it's a bit like that. That's, that's the way the world. That's, that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same. That's really it, yeah. What's in the pipeline for you now? Are you slowing down to the extent that you only do a gig an odd time? Or is it like whenever the gigs come calling? What's your approach now? Well, well, well I think that the next two things I'll be doing is one, is that I'll be up on YouTube sprinting very fast and throwing down the gauntlet worldwide to anybody who wants to take me on. But at the same time, I'll be I'll be doing an al- I'll be doing an album of uh, kind of songs that are more about like what I was doing earlier on things like uh, say I try you know I try to be a raconteur than a cantankerous who and where I where I I write songs like that and I write songs like uh, I wrote you know the, the seven deadly sins and I'd be talking about this that and the other oh bits and pieces like that and ultimately I'll be talking about Having a bit of crack. Uh, intelligent crack. You know, I'd be having a bit of crack, but people would be saying, most of the people who'd be there would be secondary school teachers because you, like, you'd, you'd be using the your vocabulary in a particular way that would be interesting. And that has never been done anywhere before worldwide because nobody has done the 26 letters in the alphabet as one song. So I would start off singing the adept aesthetic with the aesthetic attitude like to alleviate the adverse wind in an ambiance of a card. The authenticity of his argument would ameliorate the angst and the student altruistic articulate alternative to say after the apex of his diplomas and not capability, agility, eclecticism, admiration, affirmation, adulation, adoration, accreditation, assimilation, and advantages for all. And then you go straight through the alphabet to the end. But you, you know. That's one song. But, yeah. That's, that's one song. The new Bob Dylan of poetry. 26 verses. The new, yeah, the new, the new Bob Dylan. <laughs> the new 77-year-old Bob Dylan. <laughs> You're going to do a, a song for us. What are you going to play for us? I, I'm going to play The Fields of Ant Roy just for the crack and explain to people that when Paddy Riley done it, it, it was an event. An, 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 and when I do it, it's a protest. Brilliant. But I always, you know, Peace St. John told me... P. St. John told me when he heard this first, he said, Brush, yours is my the favourite one of all time, your version. And then when he heard Sinn Féin were using it, he said, I said, I can't really talk about Brush's version anymore. <laughs> it's still Republican. That's what he said. It's still Republican, the fields of Atten Roy. P. St. John, the guy who wrote it for my singing. That's it. That's it. Simon, it's a real nice time to you. 
But I've got to go now and watch the hurdle. Thank you, friend. My lonely prison wall. I heard a young girl calling. My God, they have taken you away. For you stole the rebellion's car, so a young might see the morn. And now the prison ship lies waiting. Wow, brilliant. Sounds really nice, Brush. Your voice sounds great. Ah, I'm uh, like more blessed with the uh, double hip replacement. It makes a big difference to your throat. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, that sounds great. Your voice, I mean, you wouldn't think it was a man of 77 singing that song. It's a great, your voice sounds brilliant. Actually, we're we're blessed in the sense that, uh, you know, we kind of, we never really got hoarse or anything, never. Any problems with anything like that, and uh, but then I, I, I know how to use it, you know. So, Bruce Shields, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure the audience are going to love your stories and they're going to love your song. It was brilliant, and we really want to say thank you and we really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Ah, that's lovely, Sam. Thank you very much. Bruce Shields, everybody. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruce Shields. That was an amazing interview, and it was lovely to hear about your life in the Irish music scene and your influence on the Irish music scene throughout those years. And you know, your legacy has spawned other legacies that we have to be grateful to you for. And and it was a pleasure to have you on the show, hearing about your life. And thank you very much as well, Bruce, for playing that wonderful song. It was lovely. Very nice to hear that. And I'm sure the audience enjoyed that very much. So thank you, Mr. Bruce Shields. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you're enjoying the content and the great guests. And we'd just like to remind you, please follow, subscribe, and share the show where you can. We will continue to get you great guests, and we will continue to have great conversations. My name is Simon Kay. This is the Collective Whisper Podcast. Take care of yourself, your friends, your family, and the ones you love. Until next time, bye-bye.